Okay, team Thanks. five, are you ready? Do you want to uh, maximize your... Yeah. Three, two, one, yeah. go. Hi, we're team number five. And this is uh, Zidik, Stanion, Flavia, and uh, Hong, and me, Alexander. And uh, we came up with the idea for the electronic fridge. And uh, basically how we came up with this idea, we were talking about the food waste at the beginning. And uh, all this situation that you have some uh, ingredients for some meal that you have somewhere back in your uh, fridge shelf and they're spoiled. And uh, also we were thinking about the guys that know only three recipes like me and they try to uh, rotate them in a good way. So uh, basically we came up with the solution about uh, this meal optimizer. It's, it will be a system that uh, will help you to uh, mix your ingredients to prepare a meal in a good manner. So uh, the food waste will be reduced and um, also it will be a fascinating way for uh, more recipes. And uh, this will be an app that is downloaded on the phone. And the user, this is not the guy that we are charging for this uh, application, uh, will be able to uh, find the recipes that could be prepared with the ingredients that the guy has in the fridge. So the system uh, requires uh, some synchronization between the things that you have in, into the fridge and uh, uh, ingredients that you have in the recipe. And after the guy chooses the um, recipe that he wants to prepare, uh, if there is a missing ingredients, they will be displayed and uh, probably they will be, sent, will be sent directly to the shop and they will be prepared in a pack so the guy can just go and uh, pick the ingredients at the end of the workday. And uh, this is the technology behind uh, our solution. We have a database and uh, the, the fridge of the guy, the physical fridge. And uh, we have to cooperate with some of the stores. So through the stores, we will synchronize the data into the fridge, the ingredients that, you, that the guy has into the fridge and the database. So the system can just uh, choose which meals can be prepared with these ingredients and to make the proposals. And after that we have, we have tried to estimate some market size and so on. Thank you. Okay, by looking at this we found out who our main market segments are. And it's the good producers, the stores, for example, Fedex or Bilka or the big service stores and the end user. And what are the benefits? The good producers, they are able to advertise their brands, such as Hunts for ketchup, or those big you know, producers, they're able to advertise what solution is the best in, your, in case of what you need for the, for the recipe. And it will, of course, increase their sale. Um, the store is able to lock in customers, because in this app, you are you know, it's for one store in the beginning, so you're always able to go to this one store, for example, FedEx. And they are able to offer you such as the daily, weekly offers, so you can go and check if something is in the sale or whatever, or, yeah, like that. Then we have the end user. It's uh, saving cost, waste and time, because you don't want to go you want to save the waste, the food waste. You don't. You want to use the yogurt that you have in the end of the, of your fridge that you almost forgot that you had, and you will get diverse meals if you want to be more healthy. If you want to have, yeah, all those kind of you know specific brands. Uh, the estimated size of the market we had comparable to the Austin. It's the service where you can choose what you want. So we. This is one of our estimated yeah, group size. And then the, how many visitors are visiting the FedEx website? It's 9,000, approximately 9,000 per day. And our business proposition is uh, we're going to charge, uh, when they use those kind of chip or card in the store, we're going to charge about 1.2% yeah, of the bought items. And as well, 
advertisements and extra features. Um, what do we need to achieve? It's, we need knowledge, software knowledge, knowledge on the market, layout designs, and if the stores are willing to participate in it. And barriers to success, it's nice to have not... Thank you very much. Yes. Okay, questions. The back there. Because, okay. So when you buy the bottle of milk, it's full, right? And when you choose the, to prepare a certain recipe, it's written you use two, 200 milliliters. So it automatically will this, this, uh, subtract no. the, the amount that you have to use in the recipe. And uh, additionally, we were thinking about the f features, like you can add or... Um, subtract some things that you have used but they are not part of recipe. If you, ha if you want a, bottle, um, a cup of milk at the morning, it's not part of the recipe. But it's easy to just uh, have a click somewhere, like an icon. Okay, I used one cup. So it means constant manual update by the user? Of no, how much no, uses. that's our idea. It's absolutely automatic. When you go to the store and you buy some things, they automatically automatically go into your database. So you have some card at the beginning that you scan, so the <coughs> system knows that it's you. And after that, all the ingredients, not all the ingredients, because not everything is for the fridge. For example, if you buy carpet, it's not for the fridge, of course. But this, this uh, could be managed by the software. Yeah, but if I have a cereal in the morning, I would have to input, I had cereal. But yeah, yeah, by yeah. hand. Snack, like a biscuit or something during the day, I have to tell you I had a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. Seems like a, a lot of work. It's supposed to be like for the dinner meals. You know, you use either chicken or meal, and you, of course, you can use all those biscuit types or, or the pasta in your drawer. It's, it's supposed to be easy handy if you're doing this recipe, you know, components. Question here. I was just thinking that there's some sort of cooperation between you and the other mm. recipe. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because our question is what to cook, and their question is how to cook it. So, it's mm. a good point. Yeah. It's more of a comment. Um, maybe you could incorporate some sort of a diet function. Um, it seems that it yeah. could be a, a way of coming. Yeah, we were thinking about all these kind of features, like if you are yeah. on a diet or allergic. So. Don't don't uh, propose a recipes with cinnamon, for example. I don't like it, and stuff like this. Okay. Will you incorporate shelf life? So, for instance, if you have some some food products which is uh, running out, yeah, that yeah, that it'll suggest that you cook for those first, or so you don't just end up with a lot of food that's. At, at the moment, it will be very difficult to do it because you have a. Uh, three days for a milk, for example, and you don't know at exactly which date it's produced because they, um, they have a milk into the store, which is with the different expiration of dates. But um, for the further development of the system, there will be an RFID tax in each uh, product that's for the future. We have investigated that, and they, they will try to uh, put this tax on each product, and this tax will contain information about the expiration date and, and the, um, yeah, everything about the product, basically. And if this RFID is integrated into the fridge, of course, in the future, then uh, you will, it will be much easier to, to manage the, um, the products that go in and out from the fridge. Mm -hmm. uh, my question is, how do you see yourself, for example, uh, cooperating with Vertex? Uh, I see... Uh, for example, we come up to them and say, we have this app, uh, would you like to cooperate with us? I don't know, they will maybe give you some money for advertising or something. But what if they say, oh, you're, you have a good idea, we'll put it in our app. Yeah, that's the main issue at the moment, because if we tell them about our idea, it will be very easy for them to, to implement it. Yeah. There's a question right at the back. 
yeah, I was wondering uh, with regards to your uh, food identification problem on this at home, what you've used, you could maybe try and use uh, like one of those barcode reader apps, yeah. the smartphone app, which may help identify what foods are getting used in a list and be able to update it in time. Mm -hmm. okay. But do you want to take that as a comment? Yeah. Okay. Um, a last question there. Uh, what about spices and things you don't store in the fridge? Yeah, but it's it's not only the the components you store in the fridge. It can as well be pasta or or spices. But it's hard to estimate the spice if you're using one tablespoon or not. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of yeah, that's also a barrier for us. All those components that are not easily recognizable, you know, you don't know what to use. Yeah? Seems like you need as fast as possible to make some user tests. Yeah. Mm. The concept and get some feedback from users if they like yeah. this or not. I agree. Do you have any plans to do that? Yeah. You make survey. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, the last question from the floor then. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking, you said that you were going to use it like with one store and I think and why is that? Because I'm, I'm seeing this as a, like you use it when you don't have time to plan dinner and you're like on the run. So, like for me, for instance, my problem is that I, when I get home, they are closed and I need to go to like the event or something that's actually open. Uh, so we, we have to cooperate with some of the stores because we, we need the information from their store, from their cash desks to uh, update constantly the information into a database. So that's why we, we need to cooperate with some of the stores, maybe not Fiotex, but we estimated that probably this is the, the, the most suitable for us chain because they have this service-oriented uh, policy. But uh, the good thing is that if you are going home and it's late, yeah, you, uh, yeah. If it's too late, we don't, we cannot do anything. But uh, if you are at the end of the day, they will uh, pack everything for you, and ju you just go and bring it, mm. take it. So that's what we can do. Yep. Jakob, uh, could one uh, consider like a, a ramp down version where you just uh, you know restricted certain certain items you know in your household? I'm just thinking. Uh, I definitely agree with the fact that you need some 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 user uh, validation here, and I also think that you probably need some user actual testing, where you sort of go through some cases where the users actually interact with well some kind of prototyping your system that could be using now you have this many A's left or whatever. That aside, could one think about okay? Just monitoring certain items that you don't just go and have a drink of. Let's say the milk could be hard because people tend to get a glass of milk and maybe they're a bit tired and they don't press a button. Maybe it's you know the olive oil or it's uh, mm. the uh, the pasta or something like that. Something you just don't go and get quickly because yeah. it could be something you know going home instead of going into the kitchen and realizing oh did I have pasta left? Uh, then you have a system here for monitoring you do have past left. So mm. that's not something you should go that's on purchase. Right. You already have that. You have the olive oil. So maybe one could think of it in a sort of a step-down version that's easier to maintain and easier to manage because you have a lot of complexity that needs to be handled with regards to user behavior. And that's, uh, that's something that could, that could kill a project like this. Mm -hmm. So maybe a simple version. <laughs> Is that, a, is that even possible? You're, you're the one to know something about this. Yeah, it could be done, but uh, we were looking at the competitors and uh, there are some uh, sites that you enter all the ingredients that you have into the, into the fridge and then the site propose you a meal. So if this site works, when you have to uh, put all the ingredients by hand, why don't work uh, an application with just one click for the milk? Yeah, of course it could be. Sure. It, yeah, it yeah. could be a problem, and it's not, it's not a. It needs to be tested. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as a suggested activity, I think you could write some scenarios down of user profiles, such as wakes up in the morning, wants to know what they're going to have for dinner later on. Wakes up in the morning, is planning on going shopping later. At work, calling their partner, saying, "What are we going to have for dinner tonight?" Cycling home, wanting to pick up some food from the supermarket. Mm -hmm. Find where your niche uh, application is here. When when is somebody really going to use this? Um, also, 
I'm not too uh, convinced by the idea that people will monitor and keep their their stocks up to date. So I think that's the bit you really have to uh, mm -hmm. do some market research on, mm -hmm. and give them a very good reason to do it. Mm -hmm. um, those are you can take those as comments. Uh, but thank you very much. Group number four. Ready? Yeah. Three, two, one, go. Hi, um, we're a group of four. My name is Skuli, and with me are Emil, Christian, and Jenny. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna tell you about our product, which uh, we call Vipen. Um, first, a little background. Most people who have difficulties walking or are in wheelchairs, excuse me, suffer from low blood circulations in the legs, which causes excess fluid to build up. This is known as edema. Edema decreases the range of motion and causes pain and discomfort. We have created a product uh, that addresses this issue. We call it Vipen. Uh, Vipen is Danish for the seesaw. Uh, this device gently moves the ankle, relieving edema by manually moving the legs, stimulating the body's natural system that removes this excess fluid. Uh, this can be done while the user enjoys a stationary activity such as watching TV or reading a book. It's small, easy to use, and designed for home use. Uh, it only needs to be used for a short period, a few times a day, depending on the medical condition. We have designed this product as a typical storage box, uh, which lets the user feel comfortable in the home, avoiding the feel of a uh, cl medical clinic. Um, there are similar competing products on the market, and uh, Jenny is going to tell us uh, why we think we have a competitive advantage. We want to focus on elderly in wheelchairs who aren't able to move their ankles sufficiently on their own. Current solutions that don't require physical exertion from the user are either affordable but uncomfortable, like electrodes which shock the leg to reduce swelling, or are comfortable but very expensive, like a training bike which gently moves the leg to increase circulation, but lacks circulation about the ankle. We want to create a device that is both comfortable and affordable for an elderly person to use, and that fits into the home environment so that they can use it whenever they need to relieve pain. And now, Emil will explain our market. Um, from, <laughs> from research and statistics um, concerning people sitting in wheelchairs and elderly having walking problems, um, we have estimated a total market size in Denmark to 140,000. And by, by splitting this market size into subgroups, of people living in retirement homes, in senior homes, and younger people having um, sitting in wheelchairs, and then analyzing each of these um, subgroups individually, um, we estimate to sell uh, 1,500 or 7,500 uh, women in Denmark. Uh, comparing um, the Danish market size to other developed countries, um, we see that the statistics are quite similar. So by scaling the Danish sales figures up, um, we believe that, uh, that um, it's possible to sell uh, around uh, 1.5 million Bibin uh, worldwide. And now Christian will tell you about how we will reach these numbers. Yes, so in order to uh, achieve success, we'll have to overcome our, our biggest barrier, and that is to reach our customers. To reach our customers, we will first contact the retirement homes. They will buy it for the actual users, which are their residents. Um, and we'll do that through personal contact since there aren't that many retirement homes in Denmark first. Then we're going to contact the physical as well as occupational therapists, since if they know the product, they could recommend it to the actual users, their clients or patients. This we'll do by phoning, emailing, and uh, sending them brochures. So, the way we're going to sell this product is through uh, online retailers such as 
for instance, in Denmark, Senior Shop, or through our own um, internet store. Yes, when we're going to expand into other markets, we're of course going to collaborate with international retailers then. Thank you. Questions? Marketing strategy seems to be quite expensive, uh, expensive and personal uh, expensive related if you want to contact everybody who is personal. I think cost of salary would kill at least the profit for a long time. So I think maybe another type of marketing model would be worth considering. The problem is that, that we are not on the market and it's a hard uh, market to, to get into because they are not researching or they are not on the internet. So since there aren't that many retirement homes, we think that the best way is to contact them personal because they will buy several, each of the retirement homes for the residents. So we're not contacting each of the residents, we are contacting like homes. Okay. And I think that we will use this, that the retirement buy our product to, as a marketing to sell the product on the internet. So it's some, of course, it's a costly starting point, but mm. after then we hope to, like, it will more roll of, mm. yeah. Uh, is it the end user that's going to buy the product and how expensive it's going to be? Um, yeah, we have this. Here is just, yeah, we, we believe that it's possible to sell for 750 Danish crowns, and it's roughly estimate of the prices, but it's, it should be the end user who should buy our product. Uh, of course, at the retirement homes, it should be the retirement who who, who buy the product for the uh, for the yeah for the pe for the old people living at the retirement homes to save time because they don't need to do this exercise with the the, the people. Yeah. And this also um, fits right in with the uh, more expensive uh, uh, solutions like the uh, training bike. That costs around 2,200 kroners, and uh, the electrodes uh, are also uh, there were about uh, 1,300. So this should be able to. Uh, this this price is um, very competitive. In order to gain access to market, maybe you could team up with a wheelchair provider. Shops that distribute to to, uh, to this segment, this market segment. Have you um, yeah, thought about this option? Yes, uh, actually we are thinking about, uh, we didn't include it in, in this uh, short presentation here, but uh, in our final uh, pitch uh, we are going to uh, incorporate or, or uh, yeah, integrate uh, um, this product actually into wheelchairs. So that way you could uh, add, uh, buy a special add-on to your wheelchair that would uh, do this uh, same th motion as uh, this device, which is uh, only intended for home use as of now. Does it come with the wheelchair? Is it post or does it come with the wheelchair? We thought of both. Um, we're, we're thinking about starting with uh, post-fitting, um, but we're also thinking about uh, creating uh, like a whole wheelchair with uh, designed around this product. Okay. Yeah. Did you have a plan for validating the effect of your product? Uh, and if so, um, will you only rely on user experience, or do you have parameters that you can uh, m monitor? Um, uh, you want to take us? Yeah. <coughs> sure. Um, yeah, I think we we want to validate it by like try try it on. Um, um, on people who suffer from edema. And the, th the way we want to test this, it could be to put the leg into water um, before and then after we have done these exercises and, and then see how much uh, it, yeah, the volume change in the leg. And, and we've scheduled uh, just a small scale test uh, on, uh, on one person. Uh, which is uh, going to be done in the uh, spring break, no, the Easter break, sorry. 
We'll have two more questions there, and then uh, that's it. Um, have you thought of making it a joint venture with uh, Ilpasain? They've already made a uh, 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 mobile phone specifically for elderly people, and I know that uh, it was just sort of endorsed by them, and they don't produce it or anything or gain the or have any. I, I just think they they endorse it and said this is this is um, something we recommend for elderly people, and then you would also have elder line, which would also be able to help you sort of get out, and you could probably tag along with them and and see it and get some feedback. Right, thank you. We uh, haven't actually considered uh, that one specifically, no. Okay. Yeah, I think that's also a bit of our thought by introducing it to physical and occupational therapists so they can recommend it for the, the elder people. And last question there. Uh, I'm just, I mean, you say you have about seven and a half thousand buyers in Denmark and for a price of 750 pounds, that's generally about <coughs> Five and a half million dollars, and then with a four percent uh, profits around two, two and a half million. With the balloon cost and this expensive market strategy, would the, the profit that the, the company wouldn't have had hard to, to generate money? The uh, these figures are um, very conservative, uh, conservatively uh, estimated. Um, but uh, we've uh, we've created a f uh, five-year plan. Maybe we should, if you could. Well, yeah, we, we've created a five-year plan. But the, the thing is that, of course, in order for this to, to succeed, we need to expand to other markets than just Denmark. That's that's obvious. So, so we have done this uh, this five-year plan, and and you see here from the from the bottom line, you see that we'll get profit in, in, in year five, and that's when we're gonna expand worldwide. So before that, we'll definitely not, uh, not earn money. Okay. Any questions from here? Um, I was just wondering, when you first uh, came up with this idea, um, was your starting point uh, what a physiotherapist would normally do for a patient, or was it more that you looked at the bicycle and how the pedal, I mean, what was the, how different is, it, is, is what you're doing from what, how these patients would have been helped with this problem? Well, the, the initial, um, it, was, it was a project um, made of our fifth member who has left us by now, but um, her mother is in a wheelchair and suffers from this problem. And the way she was being taken care of was by a therapist uh, moving her foot up and down uh, in one of yeah, when where where she lived used to live, um, so the 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 method is changing um, from therapist to therapist. But that was the initial idea. So we thought that we could um, relieve or we could do this work for the therapist by making a creating this machine instead of the what therapist. About, what about the dips on the on the on the bicycle pedal? Is that is it diff very different from that or not? Yeah, right now they they don't uh, like relieve edema from your from your ankle, okay. so that's the actual problem that um, our device does. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, looking at your uh, excellent uh, comparison of uh, your uh, product to other products, the uh, the lovely electrodes and other uh, products. I'm kind of thinking 750 kroner, that sounds like a pretty, you know, that's not really a high price, is it? <laughs> I'm just thinking, uh, could one think of uh, segments or, uh, you know, these persons, I know you've been in contact with some of these retirement homes, if I'm not mistaken. Is that what they're willing to pay? Don't you think they're actually maybe even willing to pay more than that? Have you tested that out? Have you tested the level of your pricing. I'm mm -hmm. just saying that you should maybe try to make as much money at this early stage as you can. <laughs> yeah, we, we asked the retirement home, actually they were like, yeah, 500, 1,000 kroners, that was nothing. But I think our main uh, first customer, uh, yeah, first customer in the long run will be the, the old woman or man at home. And we think that this, it will be too much for them if the price will be much higher than this. Sure. But, but having said that, you have a very strong product and you know, going to the therapist, having that done, it doesn't take a lot of trips 
for this device to pay itself back. And this is something you can do in the comfort of your home. You don't have to call someone. You don't have to rely on someone else. There's a lot of value there. Sorry. Adam. Um, I guess we'll just take that as a comment to consider yes. our price. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'd just like to echo the compliments. I think this is probably the best slide I've seen today uh, in terms of how you've segmented your market and uh, laid out your costs. Um, I think there was a, a really good question from here somewhere um, about the parameters of how you measure uh, the improvement of this. Because I think it, you, you've basically got a growth strategy of building up a customer relationship and then expanding. And that all depends on how successful and good this product is. And I think you need to perhaps now nail down those parameters. You said volume. Is it, is it volume? Is it movability? What, what really are the parameters you're going to be measuring and how are you going to measure those in a real situation? Right. right. And, uh, and uh, we will be working on that in the Easter break. OK, great. Thank you very much. Um, which group? Group 10? Okay, <clears throat> three, two, one, go. Hi, we are Group 10. We are the group with the graduating brake lights. First of all, I would like to present you what, what the background for, for, for our product is, what got us motivated for, for, for creating the, the product that we did. Uh, if we look at the, some statistics that uh, an average Danish driver wastes approximately t nine minutes every day queuing, uh, and that's totaling 213 hours per day. And that's a, and which again is equivalent to 29,000 full-time jobs uh, on a yearly basis. And in addition to, to all the work time which is wasted, there's uh, a lot of emissions coming from the, all those cars uh, queuing. Um, another another issue another issue that that comes from 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 cars driving uh, close to, to one another are accidents. And 29.7% of all accidents are rear-end collisions um, that, that occurs when motorists uh, traveling from behind fail to observe, observe how fast the vehicle in front of them are deaccelerating, de thereby colliding with the, the car in front of them. Uh, accumulating all those three problems, we have created a problem that helps solving it by by having a deaccelerometer uh, having a deaccelerometer uh, attached to the vehicle, this is essentially uh, an accelerometer with a visual display built into a number plate uh, holder. So it's a standardized size, size that fits all cars, and that gives a visual a visual graduation on how how fast the the car in front of you uh, are deaccelerating, and that helps to prevent uh, queuing because some of uh, uh, actually a lot of the queues which occurs is so-called brake queues because the drivers are not aware on how fast the cars in front of them are deaccelerating, so they're deaccelerating more than they have to in terms of braking, and uh, and, and also helps prevent uh, rear-end collisions as it gives an extra warning if the car in front of them are braking really, really fast. It's, it's in terms of an extra brake light. We have tried to establish our market and size by looking at how many cars there, there being, new cars that are being sold per year in Denmark and how many used cars that are being, that, that are being sold in Denmark. And, we, and, and if we take those numbers, we come with a conservative market of 320,000 pieces per year. And that is that you have to keep in mind that every time you, you buy a new car, or and most of the times that you are purchasing a used car, you have to get new number plates. Yeah. 
so therefore we made an estimation uh, of how many money we can make on this. Uh, so as we said, we want to target the, our customers as all the car dealers, not the end users. Uh, so hereby we get our revenue from, uh, from every number plate holder which is sold. Uh, and if we uh, start the first year, we want to we we'll think a reasonable goal is to reach around 3% of the market uh, to enter slowly. Um, and that, uh, that read, that's, then our calculation is based on around 10,000 units. Um, and if, as we can see, we have a manufacturing price around 70 kroner. Uh, and then we want to uh, sell it for around 170, so we make a profit around 100 kroner on uh, every uh, sold item. Um, but hereby we also uh, give the, the retailer uh, a nice margin in around 235%. Um, so we have to find out our strategy of how to make the retailer send the product to the end user. And uh, one of the keys here we suggested is to uh, that he uh, he can earn a nice margin by it. He also uh, needs to, um, what do you call it, uh, install it for the customer, so who he will make some extra benefits for for the implementation. Uh, as we calculated, uh, if, if this succeeds in this, uh, we will earn one million uh, on the first ten thousand units. Uh, then we need some uh, funding to start. We thought about maybe Kickstarter uh, for the project in there. Uh, then we have some uh, design to do, um, and then we thought about uh, to patent the, the integration of the gradient braking lights into the license plate to, uh, to keep us safe from uh, competitors. And then we need, of course, some logistics. Um, and I think the barriers we need to, uh, to, con uh, to succeed, it's just a fit to find the right price to make the customer, to make the retailer uh, sell the product. Uh, and of course, then the, there's uh, some funding, how to get the first start capital, and then we need to okay. work around the legislation. Thank you very much. Do <laughs> have a first question? This one over here. Okay. Uh, in Denmark, we have strict rules about that you're only supposed to have white light around your license plate. Plate is legal to add a breaking light around to the license plate as well. I think what we thought of is to tap into the third uh, brake light. This is a, you, if you notice, you see a lot of vehicles have a third brake light, which is placed in, in actually where you have the window. And it's a brake light, it's not white light, it's red light. So it, if, it, if, you, if you look at it visually, it, let's say this is the number plate. Then the light is, unfortunately, I don't think we have such a good digitization of it. But this is actually one of the prototypes, uh, and not an actual, but, and, and you just have the light, lights in the bottom of it, and it's just red LEDs. It's, it's no white lights or anything like that. So I, I think we should be within the law. Um, oh. On the slide, one of our barriers is like, like we need to overcome. Yeah, we have to, but I don't think we're, we're not the wrong color or anything. We, we thought about that. Yes, they sure, but you can have red lights. That's the And you can look into whether you can either see these uh, brake lights on and, uh, and lights on the plate because they're quite low, and as I can see on this picture, the lights are quite small. So, would the, yeah, the vehicle behind you the, the, would they? I think that's 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 the barrier, of course. But but if 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 you notice of it, all the license plates have to be placed so you can see it. It's it's a demand actually from the legislation, and and we we looked into using some 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 fairly powerful uh, LEDs, so so the light would be would be would be quite quite powerful. So so it should be visual, but that's. That's something in developing work, but I don't feel that the, the placement of the number plate is, is going to, to create a problem because if we have to use a, a standardized point, uh, that's at least our, our vision is to use a standardized point where to, to integrate this one so it fits on all cars. Question here. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know that this system is pretty logical how it works, but is it, would you be the guys who have to train drivers how to actually, you know, what one light means or two light means or three light means or how that regulate or even regulations? Are you the guys who are going to do that as well? Yeah, we we thought about it would be very intuitive to use, uh, and it's like a standard that everybody would just to see one or once or twice, and you would figure out how it works. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, you're thinking, uh, especially with the smooth traffic flow, doesn't that mean that most people really need to use this? Because you're just having one or two cars, I mean, you're on the road, highway, so it's a cars, doesn't really make a difference, does it? So, what for me is uh, if I'm going to buy this product, what does it really do for me if I value it? Has it? Yeah, uh, we talked about that's the one of the main issues as well. Uh, but there's again, uh, the insurance companies might want to, uh, to lower your. What you call it, your price or something? If you got this uh, due to safety, because it will increase general safety. So I think that's one of our target points to do it this way. Uh, thanks for a nice presentation. Uh, I was wondering if um, what kind of document documentation you can uh, find for this product that will actually work. How would you do that? Uh, you mean like to make it work like? No, like uh, does how do, how can you show or convince people that this will make the traffic more smooth? Yeah. Uh, Any test? What, what is like? This is seems like a dream, or until yeah, there's some facts that it's possible. Yeah, we haven't got any proof. And, but can you think of any uh, way you can test this or? Yeah, of course. You can fit it onto cars and test it with the cross <laughs> Yeah, okay. Maybe we'll get a, a small uh, testing village and see uh, a popular little group. Yeah, I think you would be nice to have some kind of. Uh, yeah. I, I think the whole thing is if we look at it, because right now when you when you're let's say when you, when you're in a queuing environment or you're driving a highway with a, where there's an abrupt stop stop. Right now, you only have an analog signal. You have an analog signal, and then yourself have to use your senses to to, to determine how how fast the, the car the cars in front of you are braking. And I think we, as people, are, are at least the majority of us, are really bad at doing that. So to to, to protect ourselves, we 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 tend on braking very very hard. And I think, of course, the, but so I think it will help you. Right, you have to find some question scenario to prove it. Uh, and that's that's a barrier also. I'm going to take one last question from the back and team 11 come down to the front and uh, look at the brake. If you consider the solution of just measuring how hard you are pushing the brake instead of uh, yeah. measuring the e acceleration. But that's, uh, that's an, uh, you have to do a lot of more, uh, what do you call it, uh, monitoring. You have to mount something for the pedal and stuff. The, the nice thing with this product is that you only Need, it's a license plate which fits every car. You don't have to do any other installment just to plug in some power for it. Uh, and it's a unique way of scaling. You can scale it to almost all of Europe and uh, you don't have to customize it for any particular car. Or and also, depending the, 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 the force which you apply to the brakes doesn't necessarily mean that the car is de-acceleration de with the same force. Because de-acceleration, depending on the brake on the different types of cars, you know, I recently cut a new car and that brake is really, really powerful. But, and the old one wasn't braking so powerful. And we want to see how fast, you know, how fast the deacceleration happens on the car itself. So by having the accelerometer and uh, relying on that one, we have the relative deacceleration and not how fast we want the cars to brake. Okay, so that this, uh, this, this is integrated into the... Yeah, the number table. Okay, yeah. so it's completely independent of the yeah. mark. Okay, and, and there's, uh, is there any, have you seen any use of a, a, a meter of that sort in other contexts? I mean, we're, we're, I mean th this must be technology that you've yeah, it's found. A, it's, an every, it's a little, the accelerometer is a little device which is in every mobile phone or used for when you maybe pick up the phone, it will unlock the screen or something. Uh, so the, I don't think the technology is very advanced. Actually, actually on, 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 on some modern cars, uh, there's, if, let's say if you do an emergency brake, that's actually placed an accelerometer both on the uh, speeder pedal and the brake pedal, and it measures how fast you, you lift your uh, uh, can, how fast you the, you lift off the speeder pedal and you start braking, 
And, and if you do that really, really fast, it breaks much fast, uh, much more powerful than you would have done. So it's used in, in a mm. wide variety, these accelerometers, they, they're used everywhere. Um, I just, uh, first of all, thanks for that. That was very, uh, very nice and well founded. I, I don't necessarily think that uh, selling, uh, providing a 235 percent profit margin uh, to the car uh, seller is is going to be very attractive because what is he going to sell? Let's say at the most ten cars a week or something like that. Uh, I'm just being, you know, realistic. So, so what I would do is focus more on the value of it. This car salesman, actually, he's the one who gives your family, you know, a, a safer uh, transportation to work, and he's the one uh, who, th who thinks of your children. Those arguments are a lot more worth than just, you know, a 235% uh, sales margin amounting to 230 kroner. So I would, uh, I would definitely move my focus to that, because then suddenly your product is a heck of a lot more valuable. So that's a comment. <laughs> I, I'd echo that. I think your figures are really good and you've done a great amount of work. I think you made the wrong choice uh, selling it to uh, end users. I think it should be at the retailer. They fit it. It's great branding for them. Um, and they become the ethical car retailer as well. I think it's, it's got a lot of value there. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, final group, three, two, one, go. Okay, hello. Uh, we're Team 11, and uh, this is our idea for a cat size installation system. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with the term, these are cat size, the devices that light a road at night so a driver can drive more safely. They're not all that common in Denmark, but they're quite widespread throughout the EU as a whole. Uh, now, there are currently two ways of installing them, and they both involve adhesives. The first is to drill a hole into the asphalt and to stick the cat's eye below ground level, which is the more robust method of doing it. The second is to simply stick it right on top of the asphalt, which is cheaper and faster, but not quite as secure. And this uh, is normally done by hand. So the traditional cat's eye installation requires five people and about four minutes per, per cat's eye. Uh, there's, I'm going to break down the process for you. Uh, the first two minutes are taken up with drilling a hole in the road so that the cat's eye can be stuck in. Uh, this is quite a precise operation, which is why it takes the longest. Following that, the hole has to be cleaned of the, all the broken asphalt and uh, to quite a high standard so that the adhesive forms a strong bond with the road. But this takes a minute as well. Following that, it takes a further minute to glue the cat's eye into place. So it's a four minute operation in total for each cat's eye and takes five people. However, we have a proposal which could significantly improve this process, which is an automatic cat's eye installation device. Uh, we intend to develop one machine that can do all of these operations. Uh, this will reduce the required number of workers to one, uh, but more importantly, significantly reduce the time it takes to install a cat's eye. So that not only will the process itself hopefully be cheaper, but uh, we feel more importantly, the benefit to the economy as a whole due to the road being closed for less time will uh, make our idea worthwhile. We've identified a, a potential uh, market due to the number of compatible roads throughout the whole of the EU. We've estimated that we could install at the least 7.9 million units. But our most optimistic estimate gives us a potential market of 47.2 million cat size to be installed on the roads throughout Europe. However, initially we intend to focus only in Denmark, where the same criteria give us these estimates of a, a pessimistic number of 98,000 units to be installed and a more optimistic uh, estimate of 588,000 units. And the way we propose to uh, sell our idea is to in a, through a business to business model where we sell to the road contractors who are responsible for the road maintenance uh, and they are paid by the government or the council departments responsible. So we would intend not to sell the machine directly to them but to hire it to them or perhaps even to lease the idea to a 
third party who would develop the machine, depending on what funding we could get. We believe this would be the, the best option for all involved because we can maintain a steady income from our idea and from our business and the road contractor doesn't have to uh, spend too much money purchasing the machine. They only pay for what the amount of time they'd use it, which would, they wouldn't be installing cat size all the time. So we feel this would be the best way to proceed. However, we've also identified a number of potential barriers to uh, this approach where uh, we first have to actually develop the machine. We need to develop the technology that allows this idea to proceed. We also have to cultivate the political will to uh, implement cat size and the kind of scale we would need um, to make this idea worthwhile. Uh, the cost of the machine also has to be sufficient to make it economically viable. Uh, we have to ensure that there's no competition that's going to take the carpet out from under us, so to speak. And um, we also have to contend with the potential lack of demand. We Not only do we need to convince uh, any government departments or road departments and councils of the, the necessity of this machine for installing cat size, but also the road contractors themselves. We need, we need to show them that this idea is going to make their business in... Um, getting contracts from government departments to do road maintenance uh, much more attractive to the government de departments involved. So, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Cat okay, at the back. I'm thinking, what would make Denmark start using this cat size on the road? We feel that uh, if we can make this process economically viable enough, then they would become the, the best way to improve lighting a street at night rather than street lighting. Uh, and we're also selling this as like a, a safety device. If we can convince politicians that um, they can score kudos really with saying they've installed more uh, or made the roads safer in an, in an economic way, we think this idea will proceed. Do you want to uh, share the load, by the way? Yeah. Um, no worries. Yeah. Uh, so I, I like the idea that we want to hire out the equipment to the contractor, but why don't we just hire out the full service? That you contact us and we put manpower and everything, and no really reason why the contractor should educate people for running the machine or something. There is one possibility when you're renting out the machine that you can also uh, uh, give out one advisor with the machine that can actually instruct the workers. But when doing it this way, uh, we try to make use of the contractors which are already maintaining the roads. So we can do this uh, doing a normal maintenance of the roads. So we don't need to have more downtime just because we want to install uh, cat size ourselves. So that way around, we can make sure that uh, the downtime of the road are used more up, uh, optimal that way around. Have you thought about the bicycle lanes as well? I know Denmark installed sort of lights in bicycle lanes. Yeah, right now we are we are working to we are starting up some contact with a, a company that are developing these kind of uh, uh, cat size and more lit marks uh, cat size, and they are experimenting on uh, bicycle roads at the moment. Um, but where we see the greatest benefit for us is that there, there's a much bigger potential uh, in our machine on the highways, uh, mainly because of the downtime. Um, the downtime on a, on a bicycle road is not that expensive uh, to the society as when you closed out the motorways. So this way around, an efficient machine to, do, machine to do it would be more valuable for our customers. Is it uh, meant only for the highways or the motorways in general? Well, at least right now we're focusing on the highways mainly to do it, but it can be done in many different places of the motorways, I mean. Okay. It's a, an additional question. In Denmark we have the white cones with, uh, with the, the light reflectors, but they also provide a um, additional uh, feature. They have a marking of their position, so if you are, ever have a crash or anything, you could just say the three numbers on them and they would know exactly where you are. Uh, is that a feature or any other features you want to implement? Any really good idea. I guess I will have to transfer the question to one of my Danish colleagues because I haven't seen them, so... Guys, <laughs> I'm sorry.
Yeah, you, you could do that. For example, with having a cat size at every one kilometer, that's maybe another color or looking kind of different. So you can see that. Okay, it's so another. That's nothing you have no, no, not yet, <laughs> but good idea. Have you considered the production costs for one of your machines? I don't know how. Yeah. No, uh, not yet. We uh, haven't looked into that so much. You know the range? Uh, just I have no idea how much a machine like that costs. Do you want to answer? Yeah. Well, uh, we really do not either because there is not really any machines doing this kind of job yet on the, on the market. That's why we see this as a golden opportunity because right now all these cat size are manhandled. You need to do it by hand and that's why uh, this machine is completely new. So we will have to look at other kind of road markings equipment uh, and we have established a contact with the company and uh, we are beginning to try to get some information on these points from them. Okay, last question from the floor. Yeah. Design subject, or are you still in the button defining phase? Do you have any potential solutions? I think that was. Well, no, we're still just working on the idea base. We, we have uh, kind of uh, narrowed out which functions we want from our machine and uh, that we, it, it has quite a bit of work to do. It has to be doing the milling and the cleaning of the road and also aligning the cat size as well as uh, when the catalyst breaks down, we want our machine to be able to, uh, to uh, uh, uninstall the units uh, as well. So we have looked into the functions, but basically uh, all, the, all the things that we need to do can already be done by machines. We just want to combine it into one unit instead of having uh, a machinery needed to be handled by five people. So, mm -hmm. Rene, you have up? I was thinking that uh, this looks like a, a business model where you, 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 you're going to rely or, or need the input of the manufacturer of the machine. So, so maybe you, you need to think about whether this is going to be a co-inventorship activity in some way, uh, part of your business model. Because I, I imagine that if you're a, a company developing <coughs> machines of this kind and you have your own R&D folk people, then, then you will probably want to have some stake in the rights. So, so, so but I mean, that, that's something you might, you could make that attractive uh, for the, your partner, but you would need to be very careful to, to make clear, you know, what your input is, so they don't steal your idea. But I mean, there, there needs to be some careful thought there. Sure. Do you have any response or are you... you well, yeah, right now uh, the company we're working with is uh, also kind of innovation company that had created a LED marks, LED marks and uh, also LED guides with some more intelligent systems that we would also like to be working with. And um, they are working, uh, they are a normal road contractor but in order to finance their project they have sold this unit to a company called Givego, which is the largest road marking company in the, in the Northern Europe. So we thought about doing that kind of cooperation as well in order to make our business uh, start up properly and then simply be a sub-segment of uh, Givego, for example. Um, I just have, uh, was, well, essentially just a, a comment. I think you've done a really good job at identifying the COGS that make this uh, this business uh, case work and this this general business idea. Uh, what you need to figure out is the size of them. <laughs> you know, you need to figure out uh, what is the value of you know uh, exact value of this congestion. Uh, okay, and if it's four minutes before, how much is it going to be now? And if you scale that, how much is it? You know, get the numbers in there because you have all the sources. You just need to quantify it because then you can really start you know answering questions like. How much can the machine cost, and uh, how much is the process going to save your customers, and blah blah blah? Could we do it as a you know a leasing, or should we do it ourselves because that's where we make the most money? So you should definitely get into that, and we would love to see some uh, specifications on the solution itself. <laughs> cool. I think there's a maybe a slight problem with the way you've constructed this. If I was these four workers. I'd have one guy going up front, drilling the holes, the other guy following, uh, cleaning them out, the other guy following, putting the glue in. So you do have four people, but essentially it's four people doing four holes, uh, four cat's eye installations. So really, 
it's only one person in terms of the time man hours taken. I suspect that's how they do it. I think they'd be stupid if they didn't. Um, well, it's road worker, so you cannot uh, count that question into okay. <laughs> intelligence. Okay. And so, some of the equipment are quite heavy, where they need two people to handle each, uh, like the drills uh, needed to be handled by two people, for example. Uh, of course, it would be, be nicer to have one machine that can just do every process faster than, uh, than each guy do his, his job. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And uh, also, if you'd just like to give yourselves all a, uh, a big round of applause for uh, the great contributions from the floor today. Thank you all. Um, if you'd like to claim your bonus point for questions asked, come down, write your student number on the um, papers in front. Uh, Varen is here. You might want to ask her a couple of questions about patenting. Otherwise, thanks for staying over time, and we'll see you on Friday.